Welcome to the second episode of Kimchi Crime Podcast. I'm one of the hosts, SJ. And I'm the other host, Walter. And thanks for checking out our second episode. I hope you enjoyed our first episode. In this channel, we'll be diving into some of the gruesome crimes that took place here in South Korea, is where we're both living. Break down some of the criminals or criminal and touch upon some things that aren't really covered by the news. That's right. But we always appreciate your support. Follow us. Give us a like and get your alerts because it's going to be a crazy ride. And what can we say? We like learning about crime. But as we always say, we don't condone it. Not at all. So let's get into our second episode. And now it's kind of a callback because I actually did cover this not too long ago. But we're going to do a part of things that I might have missed. So I'm really looking forward today because it's probably one of the biggest cases in South Korea. So uh, this is probably... Korea's most prolific uh, serial killer, you'd say, wouldn't you say to SJ? Yeah, I mean, I mean, by far, I think when we t- they talk about uh, serial killers, his name is always going to pop up. And, you know, I've always followed uh, more familiar with the criminals, uh, the serial killers back in the United States. Right. So when you talk yeah. about some of the most notorious uh, killers, you have names like Ted Bundy. And yeah. I'm going to say right now, he's the South Korean Ted Bundy because they do have a lot of whole lot of similarities, and you'll find out later on. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about Yoo Young Char, uh, the man who inspired the movie The Chaser, which, by the way, if you haven't checked it out and you're into Korean films, it's a very, very good movie. But nevertheless, let's jump right into this monster. Uh, Walter, give us a background on his life. Okay, so we're going to go really way back. As most criminals, his life was, you know, not so good from the start. He was born on April 18th, 1970 in Gochang, Cholobokdu province. Now, in the country, that's some like sort of southwest here in South yeah, Korea. Yeah. Now, he has two older brothers and a younger sister, but his younger sister is his fraternal twin, who weirdly enough, I mean, this is where it all starts to get a bit weird already. Her birth actually wasn't reported uh, a year until a year after she was born. Now, there's actually a lot of cases coming out recently to this day of unreported cases of children, which we might even get into um, because it turns out a lot of those children were murdered. And that's something that definitely we will probably get into sometime down in the future. Now, at the time he was born, his dad ditched his family, but his dad does make a return and he was living alone uh, with another woman. Now, Yu's mum was... Like, she wasn't in a a very good financial situation. This seems to be a recurring thing, isn't it? Like, the last episode, financial situation wasn't great. Uh, She even thought about even killing Yu Yong To, which is obviously not a great start, right? No, when your mom is trying to kill you, obviously not good. And this is just only because of financial situation, right? I know. I mean, this is going back, like we said, in the 1970s. Korea wasn't as developed as it is today. No. So, yep, it was quite poor. So, I mean, for you to go to that deep because you just can't afford a child, it's pretty messed up. But we are lucky that we didn't live in that era. Now, along with his siblings, uh, every night his dad and his stepmother were known to have beat him badly. Now, obviously, another connection is whenever there seems to be a lot of domestic abuse, this thing usually returns sometime Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. the future now things got so bad that he ended up moving out and began living with his birth mother again because he actually moved in with his birth father so his father left then he went and lived with his uh birth father then he was getting beaten on a daily basis moved back with his poor mother now it's not where it ends because uh obviously she's still not doing great financially um and i mean he can't go to one parent because one parent beats him he can't go to another parent because she doesn't have a lot of money to look after him but looking at his school records it showed that he was actually quite mature for his age like we talked about chong yu jong last week where she was a bit odd at school but uh yong Cho, he was good at art and sports and but he liked 
this is where it gets weird. There's always a weird part in the high school days or the school days. He liked catching frogs and breaking their necks. Now, we do hear that there is this connection between hurting animals as well as killing. Yeah. Uh, that needs to be looked into deeper. But he also showed a love for animals and even told his friends that he'd grow up to be a doctor. Isn't that right, SJ? Yeah. Yeah. Uh catching frogs and breaking their necks and that doesn't translate into being a very good doctor or anything like that but no, I mean, no, you can no. tell this guy was his life it, it's it's I, at times you know when i was reading up on this guy i felt bad you know when they're during his childhood right i mean mm-hmm. how bad has it been that you know his mom is basically like you know what i can't do-. and we've seen cases like this unfortunately here in korea where the family where there's they're so poor that you know what the only way out of this is murder suicide and it really yeah. is unfortunate and i think she legitimately was thinking about this and uh, the other weird thing like you said was if there are a twin why report his birth but not mm-hmm. the uh, sister uh, a year later so everything is just messed up you're looking at right now um uh, but it's just even elementary days, right? I mean, elementary school days, you're, it's your innocent days. You really, mm. really start changing once you get into middle school. Um, again, you know, living with his birth mother. It, it wasn't, you know, money. There was not a whole lot of money there, but it did make him a happier kid. Uh, and I think the reason why he moved to his birth mother was just because his abusive father actually died. Mm. And so no other choice than to go with his uh, birth mother. And he was a happier kid because of this, man. But mm. the, the thing is, it's in middle school when he really started using violence more and more. And apparently, uh, amongst his friends, he was a very good fighter. Uh, he used mm. to fight thugs in high school. A middle school kid fighting a high school kid, man. That, that gives you some crazy street creds right there. Yeah, of course. And so even, you know, kids who are much older than him, they're afraid of this kid in school. Uh, you know, he saw a kid getting scolded by a teacher. He'd find that kid again, just beat him up because – Basically going, dude, why aren't you listening to the teacher and just jumping him for that? And Mm. by the time it was time for him to go to uh, high school, he had a dream. And you know what his dream was? He wanted not to be a doctor, but he wanted to be an artist. So, I, you know, I don't know. I I know another crazy person who killed a whole lot of people and wanted to be an artist. And he was a failed artist and started killing people. You know, Hitler – Hitler wanted uh, to be an artist too. That's right. That, he did, didn't he? <laughs> so, and I think Hitler liked animals too, or something like that. Right. So, he was a big dog person, I heard. Yeah. And so I, you know, there, I'm, I'm not going to put him in the same level as Hitler there, but no. uh, there are some weird similarities going on. Uh, he tried to go to an arts high school. You know, there's specialized high schools. I didn't make it. He ended up going to a technical high school, which, by the way, uh, my father-in-law used to teach at a technic- technical school, and the technical schools are places where you don't have the nicest kids there. Uh, these are kids who basically choose not to go to college anyways, and they want to learn a trade uh, at these technical high schools, and so there's a lot of really bad kids there. Uh, but it's when he was a sophomore in high school, this is where he starts uh, stealing. He gets caught stealing. He goes to juvie, drops out of high school. And then from 1991, he go in and out of prison for stealing. And stealing is a whole lot. Uh, mm-hmm. That's something that comes out a lot here. And despite the fact that, and now we're already got out, into the, uh, out of high school. He's dropped out, right? He's an adult now. Uh, 1991, uh, in and out, 1993, he gets married to Miss Huang, and if getting married isn't going to scare you straight, he continues to get caught stealing, goes back to prison again. Uh, but uh, I guess stealing is not enough for a divorce. I mean, they, they welcome a son uh, to the world in October of 1994, and I guess you and I were, were a parent, and when we became yep. a parent, you know, we started thinking differently. Uh, we, we, we tend to get more mature. Obviously, that's not it. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, still there is some things that he'll do here and there. Uh, he gets a job at a photo studio, uh, at a wedding shop. Uh, he do that in the mornings and then the evenings. What he'll do is he pretend he's a police officer and he'll go into, let's just say, illegal boom boom places. Uh, <laughs> and he'll basically go, listen, I'm a police officer. I could either crack you guys down or I'm going to take your jewelry or other expensive stuff that you have. And so as we find out, he loves pretending to be someone he's not. Because mm. in 1998, 
he gets caught pretending to be a civil servant. In 2000, he rapes an underage girl. Now, let's put a list of all the disgusting stuff he's going to be doing. And in total, he spent a good seven years in prison. Now, if that was the nail on the coffin, because his wife says, screw it, I can't live with this monster. I want a divorce. So this is what it took for him to get a divorce. And I think this is something, this is what gets him, uh, triggers something in his brain. He's mad at his family. He is mad at the society. Uh, he thought about killing his ex-wife and even his own son, but he decides now he's going to go off killing a bunch of people instead. I mean, it's really interesting, right? When you think about like how he was easily able to get away with acting as a police officer, which actually goes a bit later into his murders, which we'll yeah. talk about soon. But yeah, back in the 90s and maybe early 2000s, a lot of like corruption was happening within the police department. Oh, like, absolutely. Maybe, like maybe even still these days, you know, we have a lot of illegal yeah, boom boom shops. Just to just to reiterate what uh, SJ said, still active today. And I mean, no one does anything about them. We know where they are. They're very Dude, clearly there. The craziest thing I did I saw was uh, back now. I think it's completely wiped out. But back uh, near Yongsan Station, mm. there used to be the red light district there. Yeah, and then right next to the red light district is literally a police station. And so I'm going, how in the <laughs> world you have a police station over there and still? Run a red light district which by the way again it's very illegal here so obviously something is going on right yeah there's a lot of that you know under the table sort of thing happening still like i i used to live not too far from like a sort of uh, a district that has a lot of drinking and a lot of old guys and there's a lot yeah. of massage parlors and p police would go up and down and sometimes they look a bit dodgy themselves like they're collecting debt from that shop or whatever but i still can't believe like after so many years, 2023 now, we're still not getting to the bottom of those illegal shops. But I mean, this is back in 1990s, and I'm sure it was a lot worse then. But obviously, let's now get into the gruesome, juicy stuff, which are his murders. Now, because, listen, like we said, he's kind of like the Ted Bundy, and Ted Bundy did yeah. a lot of murders, right? Now, in let, let's start with the earliest one. On September twenty fourth, uh, two thousand and three, he kills a former professor who's seventy two years old, and his wife who is sixty seven. Now, uh, he'd wipe off uh, any surface that he could have. Like he really tried hard not to get caught the first time. He was wiping everything down. He goes through all the steps and escapes out of the house. So it looks like no one, like no one, broke into the house. He was yeah. really prepared. Uh, but later finds out that he left his jacket uh, his jackknife there and breaks the front door and gets in so he, he does made all big... that <laughs> yeah he does all this and then just breaks back in right i mean he could have left the window open for like i don't know but he obviously he was it was premeditated but he made a mistake i mean he's not the smartest of people as we no, he, yeah, yeah. it just basically seems like you know what he's going look i'm gonna you know try to get rid of all the evidence here it comes out ha 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 such a genius everything is good where's my knife and so he's just gonna break <laughs> oh, into damn it, it. <laughs> like, the damn most important bit, bit of evidence is back in the <laughs> yeah but the most yeah you're right the most important evidence right <laughs> yeah not uh, the smartest guy here obviously yeah tell us about uh his other murders yeah so let's look at october 9th now this is the same year. So this is going like maybe what, two, three weeks later. He Jeez, kills man. Yeah. a couple in their 60s. Obviously, he seems to have a trend happening, which I mentioned. It's the wealthy. Okay. Yeah. So 85 year old mother who lived with them and their son, who was 35, he was disabled, the son. Now they got a blunt object, was used to kill uh his parents and his grandmother, and he was killed you uh he was killing them using a hammer. And the police say the crime scene was so gruesome that, you know, pieces of brain matter were found all over the place. Blood was everywhere. It was yeah. really, I've seen, I think I've seen some of the the crime scene photos and I'll have them uploaded if I can find them. And it is pretty bad. So yeah. a week later, I mean, he's not, he's, he's on a rampage. And to be honest with you, at this point, the police aren't even linking these together. No, this is this is this is 2003. The police think these are all separate at this point. Now, a week later, a 70 year old man. Obviously, he's got a type. He's got the older people, and a 69 year old wife killed. Their sons report the murder, and the police now say now they think there's a serial killer on the loose. And initially, they say the killer 
is out looking for the elderly but there was also other things like also that he was going to rich places like the professor yeah. very well off okay so he's got a lot of money now a month later i guess he decided to take a small break november 18th 2003 he kills an 87 year old man and a 53 year old female helper now this is where it gets interesting because now he makes the mistake of being on cctv uh uh this is young child obviously but as you can imagine, back then, the footage isn't so clear. I mean, even now, these days, CCTV footage isn't fantastic. I don't yeah. know how we have bad CCTV footage when we have, like, great cameras all the time. But they're looking for a, um, a male, let's say, 168 centimeters tall and in his 20s and 30s. Yeah, so, I, again, it's, it's it's weird, right? I mean, you have all these... CC By the way, Korea has a whole lot of cameras out there, and so, like, it's Tons. really hard to get away uh, and not get caught. I mean, we talked about, uh, you know, uh, Chung Yoo Jung the other week and uh, how she was caught kind of on the uh, CCTV uh, footage. But at the same time, you know, she had a mask on and stuff like that. So it was a little bit rough. But I, it maybe it's because of these information that's coming out, right? Like they're saying that he's targeting wealthy, elderly uh, families. Uh, he's 168 centimeters tall. He's 20 to 30 years old. Uh, they got a, you know, a preliminary sketch about him. He does kind of stop going off killing people for the time being. Yeah. Uh, he also does target different victims now. Uh, yes. He begins his killing spree again. The following year, he takes the winter off. It's mm. April 14, 2004, where he kills a 44-year-old merchant. Now, he's also changed the way he's killing the victims because he's used blunt objects to kill before. Uh, but now he's handcuffed his latest victim, and stabbed him to death. Now, the crazy thing about this is, again, he would pose as a police officer and pretend to arrest this uh, merchant. And if you're wondering why uh, the victim didn't find it weird, it's because the merchant, what he was doing, he was selling like Viagra and hmm. uh, pornographic CDs. And uh, because of this merchant, this gentleman, he's faced many police crackdowns before. And notice, you know, Yu Young Chari, he's going to go to a lot of these like illegal establishments that are kind of fearful of uh, police officers, know that police officers are going to come. Um, and at the same time, though, even when he came, he's like, OK, so this is another crackdown. But he thought something was weird about the uh, police credentials that you was presenting to him because yeah. he's seen so many police officers before <laughs> and he's seen real credentials. He was like, this is weird. This is fake. And a lot of people are saying this is probably what triggered you to brutally mm. kill the man here. Uh, mm. But the killing has a terrible domino effect because seven months after the victim's death, his younger brother commits suicide. Mm. His younger brother had a girlfriend who also committed suicide mm. eight months later the victim's youngest brother commits suicide mm. the victim had another brother who attempted suicide uh but survived that and i mean you could tell what one murder has led to just led to a number of other people taking their lives and yeah luckily for me you know, I've never had to deal with issues like this and cross yeah. my finger. I'll, we, none of us has to ever go through this, but I'm sure uh, just mentally uh, just took, took a toll on the family here. And so uh, it's just you, you, you can say that that one murder turned into multiple murders and he exactly. actually technically killed them as well. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through some of the other murders here uh, because he has a whole lot uh, from March. 2004 to July 2004, he starts killing prostitutes. Uh, there's a total of 11 women who were killed. Uh, he would cut them up, bury them. He confessed to posing as police officers and all the murders here. He's also confessed that out of the 11 victims, he had intercourse with only one of the victims because he was afraid of leaving behind what? DNA, DNA samples. samples. All right. And so... I, he finds so much joy in killing. This guy is now, he's just a maniac. He's a crazy, crazy killer uh, to the point where he, not only is he a serial killer, but now we're starting to see some crazy stuff because he's uh, admitted that he would take the brains of the victims, put mm. it in a mixer, and he'd actually consume it. Mm. And... He said he used to also have favorite parts of the bodies that he would cut off. He'd say the female genitals would mm -hmm. be 
uh, things he would love to cut off. And remember, he cut up all of his victims. And after a while, when you're doing so much of that, he became really, really good at this. And in fact, once he was caught, he even drew up a picture of steps that he'd take to cut them up. And this is something that we're going to, of course, share with all of our viewers out there. Yeah, it... One thing that I've noticed for a lot of the serial killers here in South Korea is they chop up bodies. Like, obviously, our last episode, uh, she chopped up the body. Yeah, uh, Yong To cho chopped up the body. Also, there was another murder that I talked about last week. Uh, the other uh, uh, woman, the mother, she chopped up her husband's body, which mm -hmm. is actually in the channel, which you should check out as well. I no, I don't know for a fact, but I know that it's not easy to chop up a body. It's 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 very difficult. You got to know your way around, dude. That's the thing. It's it's not as simple as hey, let me just uh, cut up a uh, uh, arm here. I mean, it's yeah, not gonna, yeah. the knife isn't going to go through the bones, and so uh, you kind of see the way that butchers uh, kind of do work on like let's say a cow and things like that. They're basically getting the limbs right, and the, you have to know how to get cut certain limbs in a certain yep. way in order for you to cut it up it's not like that knife isn't gonna cut through bones it, it, no, it doesn't work that way you're basically cutting through the limbs is what you're doing and unless you know what you're doing uh it's very very difficult and uh please no one find out how to do all this stuff because <laughs> it's kind of crazy here uh but yeah i mean he knows step by step which one he does first and uh second was this third is this and it ends up being over a dozen uh different you know i guess cuts that he makes every time uh, he cuts up the victims yeah yeah and i know that like i reported this in my last uh video with him was yeah, he likes to get smaller women. He doesn't like taller women because he said that basically the taller women were harder to cut up, basically. Nice. So yeah, it's just insane, this guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's talk about his arrest. I mean, because he does end up getting arrested finally. And this, I mean, goodness, after all the the killings he's done, he gets arrested. Tell us about his arrest. He keep well, what basically happens is he keeps calling the Masu the Masseuse girls, right? Because yeah. this is his new uh, target. Now, on July 15, 2004, an owner of a massage parlor calls the police saying that every time a particular number uh, calls for girls, they end up going missing. And uh, I don't know how that works with them. Like, how do they not pick up that earlier? Or is this a normal thing in that industry? Because like we said, it's not legal. It's, you know, for the massage parlor to actually call the police is sort of kind of going against their business right yeah. because i mean maybe they have some people in the police that you know they deal it's with possible it, but, but if they're yeah. not i mean what are they going to do uh, you know we got uh, our you know massage girls going missing i'm going to call the police i mean that's the thing you can't do that exactly so they initially they thought he would kidnap them and sell them off to other massage shops outside of seoul because a lot of these girls are also yeah, yeah. um you know working out of their you know not out of their own will so when he was actually questioned by the police, he was finally asked, uh, with the police asking where all the massage girls are, he basically confessed, saying that the string of murders were all done by him. Now, Yeah, so, they, the, so the police basically was, they were questioning him over the missing massage girls, saying, yeah. I know, we know you sold him off to other massage shops, not knowing he's yeah. basically the serial killer right now. Right, so they didn't have a clue, so I don't think the police were very smart at this point trying to put two and two together he, like there's this string of murders yeah, that is happening yeah. and this is one person that keeps going missing i just it just doesn't make sense at this point but this is where it actually gets a lot crazier he goes now i'll even tell you where the bodies bodies are buried this is how i'm going to prove to you that i killed them and they all headed out he was able actually to escape from the police station this was a police another police <laughs> error <laughs> He, he went on the run. He escaped the questioning room. He like, <laughs> I, I don't know what the police were doing. <laughs> what is the police doing, man? They can't I mean, sleep to put one and one together. He uh, goes missing. <laughs> I mean, the police that, that they would have been absolutely disgusted. Uh, uh, it, it was such an embarrassment for the force. But, you know, he gets called again, finally. But this is 11 hours later. Now, yeah. during the police question again, he would use his rights to remain silent, even though he confessed. 
But after the head of the investigation team began questioning him, he ended up confessing to four murders. But initially, he, when he was first arrested, he confessed to 26 murders. There is some speculation how he confessed. Like some of the police used certain tactics. Yeah. But we won't get into that because it's not proven. But after further questions, it was concluded that he was involved in 20 murders. And on June 9th, 2005, I mean, that's not that long ago, was it? No. I mean, he was sentenced to the death penalty. However, the death penalty virtually, as we mentioned last time, doesn't really exist here. Um, now, he, here's the thing. He's still alive. He's still alive for the past 18 years. It's now. But in January 2007, the Ministry of Justice pushed the death penalty to uh to happen and but the liberal uh oh, he was I, I believe he's the president at one point now no muhyun isn't that right SJ? no muhyun no muhyun uh yeah. well no president former president uh, no former muhyun. president yeah. yeah uh he's he's no longer uh with us anymore he's he's yeah. also uh taking his own life uh, some years ago yeah that. but yeah i mean you have a liberal administration and uh, they're going to oppose uh the death penalty right and we we always kind of and again, that, that's another topic of discussion I think we're not going to really cover. I mean, there's obviously the pros and cons of death penalties and stuff like that. But you see someone so crazy like Yu Young Char, mm. uh, it almost seems like the, the death penalty is the only answer. But when, you know, the, the death penalty is virtually non-existent in the country, I mean, what are you going to do, right? And then we'll, we'll find out. We'll, we'll talk about what he does in prison because this guy is... He's a menace. He's a me- he was a menace to society. He's a menace inside the prison as well. But just kind of going into the big question of why he committed all these murders, right? Uh, why did he target the elderly and the rich, and then later on these sex workers, right? Because I initially what they thought was, well, it's easier to just kind of kill the elderly. Uh, mm-hmm. was what was being said. And then and a lot of people are saying that he's specifically targeting the rich, though. And notice so they're, they're killing the family, right? They're killing couples or people together. And so there's a lot of people kind of saying that, you know, uh, he's always lacked money in his life. There was a lot of jealousy going on. His family was always separate, right? He's not had a, a, a normal family. So he was very jealous of families. Uh, but during the police investigation, uh, you know, he basically said another thing when it talked to it comes about to, when we talk about the the prostitutes that he killed. He said, "Well, look, uh, you know, we I wanted to just kill people that look like prostitutes, and so why not prostitutes? And also, it's also very easy to lure them. Um, mm. All you have to do is call them up, right? I'll, you know, offer them money and call them up, and they'll they'll come to wherever you want them to come. It's really easy to lure." Uh, and also, it's hard to report to the police due to the fact that they're illegal sex workers, right? Yeah. And a lot of the things, one of the other things that uh, they noticed during the investigation is like uh, the elderly he killed. He broke into their homes, killed them with blunt objects, and basically just left the bodies there. Remember with the prostitute, he killed them, chopped them up, and buried yeah. them somewhere. But with the the initial murders that he committed – he just basically left the bodies there. But after mm. the CCTV footages were being revealed to the public about him, and there was a lot of uh, invest, a lot of uh, information being out with a serial killer on the loose, he was basically being more cautious. And mm. so targeting call girls would be something that he started doing because it would be a lot safer, so to speak. Um, mm. Another thing that uh, they realized during the investigation is that all of this, you know, he was running out of cash. He would actually rob the sex workers of their money after killing them, which is, I mean, that's, yeah, you can't go any lower. So this guy is some next level criminal you're looking at. And he said something that the, the press uh, said to the press that really stood out uh, in regards to him killing all these sex workers. He said, I hope this is a lesson for all the women out there to not give up their body easily. And yeah. so, uh, uh he's a weird weird one isn't it did not like women basically and uh again i mean there is some people who are saying that uh you know his divorce with his wife yeah uh, basically triggered him to hate women is what mm-hmm. happens and so yeah i mean that it's this guy's not right yeah and he also basically said that if he wasn't caught that he'd go on and kill again so oh absolutely yeah yeah he wasn't gonna stop anytime soon but let's Let's now move on to the court case. Now, like he, 
is not right in the head. And even during the trial, he was he was being quite menacing in the trial. He did not want to attend the trial. Obviously, he doesn't want to attend the trial. But yeah, yeah. Uh, when he like, but when the he talked to the judge, the judge basically said, "You have no choice choice but to take part. You have to be there." obvious reasons you killed yeah. all these people and now we're going to put you put this big sentence on you but now here's the thing right he was so upset i mean i don't know what i don't know i'm not a killer obviously but if you've been caught for the actions why would you even be more upset because you know you, that, that's it you've been caught he's now, just basically you're wasting my time here i don't think it, it's just the matter if he's like i'm dude i'm guilty just just send me to prison like what why do you need to spend all this time and taxpayers' money to, you know, put me in a trial. I'm guilty, like I said it, you know? Yeah, so he's, exactly. He's just upset. He doesn't want to be there. It's just, you're wasting my time. You're wasting my prison time here. How no. dare you? I'm mad. Exactly. And, like, this means, like, uh, while he was on trial, he actually lunged towards the, the judge. But, luckily, obviously, 20 prison guards were there and that's how many prison guards you need to take to drag this man down by the looks of it <laughs> now it could have actually gotten much uglier if he got his ha hands on his makeshift hammer that he killed a lot of these women with now when a makeshift hammer it was sort of like a sledgehammer head with just a normal hammer yeah uh, so it was it, yeah, getting hit by one of the like one of those sort of weapons yeah yeah you're, you're gone yeah, exactly. And so they basically had it on display, right, as they were doing the trials, and this was like evidence and so forth, and it was just kind of out there. And uh, luckily, he didn't go after the makeshift hammer. Uh, but the cr crazy thing is, his story doesn't end there, man. I mean, there's so many stories of like, what kind of guy he is. And remember, this guy's not that tall, but I told you that back when he was in middle school, uh, in middle school, he was beating up high school kids. Mm. I don't know a whole lot of friends, my friends, you know, I, I had some friends who were very good fighters, but I don't know any of them who were in middle school. They were fighting high school kids and beating them up, but he was obviously a good fighter. He was athletic. You know, he said, we talked about how he liked uh, sports and things like that. Uh, he's known to attack prison guards and fellow inmates. Uh, he's put into solitary confinement for strangling a prison guard before. Uh, and <laughs> the, the way I, the way that he's spending time in prison, like it's, it's a guy that has nothing to lose, right? He's like, mm. I mean, I have a death penalty, uh, you know, death sentence, but they're not going to do anything. So I'm just going to be here for the rest of my life. What are they going to do? Give me a death, but give me life in prison. These are the scariest people. They have nothing to do lose. They'll, they'll, they'll do anything. Uh, mm. And so he's so violent in the prison that some of the prison guards are just completely scared to go anywhere near his cell. Uh, because he's been known to bite or spit on prison guards, uh, even in the shared prison cell, right? It, like in Korean prisons, it's not like in the U.S. prisons where it's like two to a cell. There, there's like mm. a big room. Maybe there's about like, I would say, uh, six to ten people in one cell. And uh, he gets the chicken leg. Uh, when the oh. food comes in, he gets the chicken leg, which means he's the top dog of the cell. No matter who yeah. comes into the cell, him being the Korea's most notorious killer makes him the leader of the cell. Apparently, no one messes with Yu Yang Chur, and this guy is just a complete madman. Yeah, I mean, now he's pushing 53 now, I think, this year, and so maybe he's getting a a, a bit too old to have to start fighting, but yeah, he would still be scared. He, he'd have this sort of reputation within the, within the jail that I'm sure puts him on a very, very high hierarchy um probably the top dog of the whole entire prison I, I don't know like i don't know exactly how korean prisons are you never see them on the most notorious prisons documentaries or anything like right, that right. but but uh you know that i still i'm still sure there's some absolute psychos that are floating around which we'll end up probably talking about a bit later on in the year but you know yeah. what's uh you know what's crazy is uh last week when we were talking about uh Chung Yu Jung, right? That we we're yeah, talking yeah. about like the, the the psychotic test or something like that they were they were taking. And so the difference between in points between Yu Young Char and Chung Yu Jung is only mm. a single point. Yu Young Char was is 23. He was 23, right? So like Yeah. So Yu Young Char was one point crazier than Chung Yu Jung, which kind of go going back to our last criminal, Chung Yu Jung. She was pretty damn crazy too. But yeah. they're saying that Yu Young Char is by far one of the craziest serial killers. 
uh, God forbid, I hope there's, I know there's a lot of crazy going on in, in Korea these days, but uh, it, it, anybody, you talk about some of the most notorious killers in the world. Uh, obviously, I mentioned like Ted Bundy. There's always going to be like, you know, John Wayne Gacy and so forth. Mm. Uh, you know, the son of Sam David Berkowitz is another name that we often talk about. Um, but in Korea, it's Yu Young Char. And yes. the fact of the matter is, I mean, at 53, you said he's still relatively young. And that's, I think that's a young age. Mm. And uh, I, it's by, it's shocking to me how long it took to catch this guy. Uh, yeah. And I know yeah. it's 2003, but it's not, mm. we're not talking about the 90s. Now. We're not talking about the 80s. I, I just don't understand why it took so long. I, I know that, like, because of his, the, his uh, capture, it changed a lot of systems within the police uh, uh, way of uh, no, handling this situation because they made that huge mistake of letting him go. Or, or he didn't let him, they, they didn't let him go. He escaped. Yeah. So this really, his uh, tirade of murders definitely changed the structure of how the police have, uh, you know, run their offices. And obviously they need, uh, better training and yeah. hopefully these days that they've done that but like you said there's a lot of crazy happening here in south korea recently and maybe we'll get onto that sometime in the new in the very early future but until then that was where we'll have to wrap it up today make sure you like and subscribe our podcast and we'll be back next week with a new episode that's right we'll see you next time see you next time